All right, hi everybody. My name is Mark. I'm Jay. And we are a couple of hacks with uh, loose screws. Uh, this is our first broadcast. Actually, it's a rebroadcast. The last one didn't turn out so well. Yeah, but, a, little, um, a little dog barking action. But, uh, a little bit of history about ourselves. Jay, tell us about your career and uh, everything you've done in corrections. Okay, well, I worked uh, 28 and a half years. Uh, retired a couple years ago. I worked 10 prisons from Max's. Med mediums, minimums, and shot camp. So I've worked the whole uh, assortment of uh, prisons. So anything, you know, you need and male and female prisons as well. So uh, quite a bit of range in all different aspects of corrections, really. Uh, what about you, Mark? Um, I got uh, a little over 20 years in the department, been through six prisons, uh, never worked a mini, uh, woman's prison. One downstate prison, I was there, and it was still a male jail, but I actually flipped over to a to a female jail. So I never had the experience of working with women, which yeah. from, from the rumor it's mill, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> uh, done everything from maxes to um, a medium B. Yeah. One jail was a medium B, so um, which was honestly there was no difference between medium B and A. I didn't see any. Well, I think the A is uh, like uh, one downstate prison fish kill is labeled the medium A. And, um, and I guess medium Bs are more like uh, softer jails, like you work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, softer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, up here, where I, when I last finished my career in medium A's, which was, um, I've done just about every job in the jail, from uh, working yeah. the dorms. Um, uh, the draft is my favorite job, I think. That kept you busy all day. Draft is great, yeah. Um, I worked at Truck Trap. Transporting was fun. Yeah. A lot of great stories of transportation. Yeah. And um, I finished out my career in the box. I worked the box. I was a floor officer. Um, now, what's now what's the box? Because a lot of people, you know, viewers may not know uh, It's a special box. housing unit. Um, the box is the place where, now normally inmates, they can't function normally in society in general. Well, these inmates can't function in prison. They're so special. They're special. So we can, uh, these are the guys who get in trouble for fighting, for drugs, for just about anything out there. A couple PC guys, too, who ask for protective custody. Or admin seg, and um, so that's where I worked. Uh, the shoe I worked was a small shoe. We call it little shoe. There wasn't many cells in there at all. I think we had 28, 48 guys. I don't know, it was 28 guys, and um, it, it was small. It was compact. Now we had S block behind us. That was the uh, that was the special. I call it the special block. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was supposedly uh, all electronic, no hands on. That was um, uh, the state yeah. brought those out. We've Remember? seen how that's worked out. Yeah, that was that was terrible. And we were recorded video and audio. Right. So now they're double bunked in two man two room. Double bunked. Yeah, that was. And um, uh, I didn't like working there at all. A lot of fights. Yeah. Audio record would record the officers, not necessarily the convicts. Exactly, because convicts could see anything. There was no repercussions on the convicts, but God forbid you tell an inmate where to go and how to get there. Yeah. You you talk to later on. I I think I worked. S block two or three times in my career and I didn't say anything the whole day. <laughs> I just, I was a sergeant at the time and I walked the block and said nothing. <laughs> how, about, how about my first day in the, um, in the new jail, I just transferred over to this prison and um, the way they did their morning lineups, after lineups, the miscellaneous officers, which I was one of them, um, with my seniority, I was picking like the two or three. I was the top, yeah. top, top picking. And so this guy, I, I gotta leave names out. Actually, throughout this whole podcast, we're gonna leave names. No names, and we're no. gonna try not to say prison names. They may right. come up, but um, right facilities yeah. will be left out just so you know. We'll say we'll say nicknames. Though. We'll protect the innocent and we'll protect the guilty. Yes. But, um, <laughs> I go to charts to pick my job, and S Block Control was up there, and this guy behind me, I knew him from the street from, you know, from a while back, but he goes, hey, hey, hey. He goes, hey, Mark, this, this is a great job. You got to pick that job. It's an awesome job. You should yeah. get that. It always goes top one or two. So what did I know? I thought he was leaving me on the street. Yeah. Right? right? Now I'll take S block control. I go down there. <sighs> worst freaking job in the prison. Yeah, because you, you're handling 200 convicts. 200 cells. And you've got a, a guy for yelling at you. Hey, and you have to, and you're really yeah. have to be on point 24 yeah. 7 on that job because you're responsible for that guy. Yeah, it was a two-story. Because he's by himself. It was a two-story. Down on the block. Yeah. Dealing with convicts. It was a two-story control because you had up and down. You had to go down yes. and shoot keys and stuff for guys coming in to break people out. Then you got to go back up there to crack this out. Back up. You have nurses wanting this, see, uh, sergeants wanting that, SEALs wanting this. Never 
ever again at work shoe control. He yeah. taught, that's hey, control you know what? He taught, he taught you good. He, you Trial by fire. Yeah. Yeah, he laughed at me at the end of the day. He yeah. says, you bastard, I'll get you, I'll get you even. I'll oh. get even with you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, but, that, um, that's funny. Um, yeah, that, that's career. the way it goes. It's guys who you think you're buddy, yeah, yeah they really helped you out. <laughs> um, I, I had a decent career. I can't really um, complain too much. And the, the point of this podcast is to bring um, a, a venue or a forum to officers who, who want to share their unique experiences yep. and, and, and troubles and problems that only our profession faces. You, you don't see this in an everyday office environment. You yeah, know. they say um, correction officers have the most... Uh, PTSD, you know, any job really, even more than army guys. You know, they've been out there for two, three years doing their thing. We've been battling, you know, in prisons and seen, and have seen everything from death to whatever. Um, no, you know, you're right. For a long time. Not to diminish the military. I mean, absolutely not. What, what they see is is, is horrific. But um, you could almost put ourselves as far as the uh, the, the mental trauma on the same level because. We don't, we're not afforded the help. Our PTSD is not even recognized. We have officers out there, and yeah, that we know, <laughs> yeah, that we know very well. That um, you basically told you suck it up, Buttercup. Yep. I mean, right. Well, you're you supposed see to be stabbings. You see uh, um, um, attacks and, and blood and violence every day, and you're supposed to go back to your job after it's all done, clean up. Bert will come in there, clean up the stuff, give you a new uniform. All right, go go back to the dorm. Good to go. Have a nice day, Jay. Yeah, to punch out a three, it's overtime, <laughs> <laughs> and you come back the next day, yeah, and just to do yep. it all over again. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, really interesting, you know how, you know, we basically had to be tough guys, you know, we, the, yeah, you know, because otherwise, you really you would get picked on. I mean, I was never picked on, but it, I, I uh, got picked the only on thing me. I was picked for is to go in the cell extraction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you look pretty big. Come on here. You can hold the shield as you go in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're, Thanks hey, you're the guy. But I was also the guy. I'll do it. I'll volunteer. <laughs> but, uh, so now, um, I'll, I'll never forget the, uh, I told you everybody, I finished out my career in the, uh, in, in the box. And, um, when I, when I first got to this facility, I was part of the, uh, the first time chemical agents were ever used in a little box. Yeah. And my, my, my supposed to be a suicide watch uh, turned into a, a, an actual freak show, which was which was nice. My two from was 15 pages long. That I was, had a riot <laughs> that was only four pages long. This was... Full Jay, blow riot, four pages long. I was a charge sergeant. I was a sergeant at the time, four pages long. How the hell is a suicide attempt... I spelled out everything from the beginning of my watch because he went nuts at the beginning of my watch, and then he uh, he he masturbated and, and spit on or tried to spit on the uh, the, the, the psych came through. Yeah, uh, she came through and um, she thought she was going to save the day, but no, nah, this guy was absolutely insane. He crapped. Now were you guys? Mind. Now were you guys getting ready to do a cell extraction? That's why you had the psych. Oh okay. no, because it, it, we wanted to get him out because he was actually he was he was um, he was crapping on the mattress. Pissing on the mattresses, we thought he was a danger from to himself. Yeah, sure, so we wanted to get him out of the cell and get him get yep. Neville out of there. And he did have blood on him, and he was absolutely going absolutely crazy. He um. He 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 was different. He tried to set the shit on fire, but that didn't work because those fireproof mattresses actually are fireproof. <laughs> so he couldn't light anything up in his cell. And um, he he was uh, we had the chaplain talk to him. We had everybody talk. The chaplain actually gave us a blessing. Because he knew we had God to go, bless in there you, right? yeah. go in there and get him. And then, you know. Oh, so you were going to do a cell extraction. To, at the end, we had to get him out, yeah. Yeah, because so that when they do cell extractions, they, they, you know, for people who don't know, they call everybody and their mother and priest, a reputable guy, to yeah. uh, come talk to the guy, maybe come out. Anything before use of actual yeah. force, planned actual use of force. So Super, when, once yeah. you have a planned actual use of force, you got to videotape it. And everything else. Yeah, and, and, and the box sergeant had to talk to him twice. It takes watch commander had to talk to him twice. Hours. Captain had to come down and talk to him. Uh, after the captain talked to him, then it was, uh, no, before the watch commander, it was the psych. The psych wouldn't try and talk him out. Right. Then it elevated to the watch commander. And then the captain actually came down. Yeah, because usually it's uh, the um, watch commander's got to talk to him. And then the highest ranking uh, official in the prison at the time yeah. available. Yeah. Has to talk to him, and then of that, course the priest has to talk that, to him. That was funny. The captain come down there, and he's he tried to be all tough. He goes, "Hey, get out of that cell! We have to come in and get you." And his response was, "Fuck you! Yeah. Come get oh, me!" All right, <laughs> and he walks away. My job's done. Yeah, and yep. then yeah, they, they set up the uh, extraction team, and uh, and uh, we actually we, we 
the extraction team was um, uh, three of them were WTOs, so they're the yeah. guys handling everything. And when they uh, dispersed, when they applied chemical agents, they actually ended up gassing the entire box because that stuff just went through. Yeah, it was supposed Ventilate, to be like they shut down a ventilation system. You two or three one second burst. Yeah, and um, it went through everything, and everybody was gassed, including all the officers. Yeah, it went yeah. through the system, and it kind of blew out. And yeah, because they, you know, but that's how you <laughs> learn <laughs> you trial by fire again because. Those guys didn't shut off the ventilation system, no, no, no. so it, it, it gassed everybody. Everybody, that's I'm, not the idea. I'm writing, my, I'm writing my tooth from. I got tears coming out of my eyes. It's oh, not it's not running down your nose. I go, Sarge, can I go up front and write this? Because this is, uh, I, I can't. can't gas this. is no joke. No, 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 no. no. I mean, I've been gassed many strength. times. Yeah. And either you're you 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 know what's happening to you with the yeah. gas. But you just can't help it. <laughs> it sucks. Like my right? eyes close like instant, and yeah. I'm. I mean, I'm a. I'm not panicked. No, I wasn't. Panicked. But but um, you know my. Once my eyes shut, they stay shut for. I mean, I got gassed. Last time I got gassed, it took me a half hour to open my eyes up. I was. And I don't know why. It was just one of the things. I, I was. I was really panicky, and because I had contacts on. Yeah. And you don't go to work expecting to get gassed. You know they say you shouldn't wear contacts, but. Come on, right. guys. How many of us go to work expecting to do a but salt you work in a prison. Yes, you do. That's why I never got contacts. It's because you knew if those chemicals get behind the eyelid, and they all right. told you, it will fuse the contact to your eyeball. Right. But I, I didn't have time. You didn't have time to go there and pop your contacts out, put your glasses on, and get ready to... You didn't. It, let's face it. 90% of the officers don't go to work expecting to... To have the chemical well, agents deployed. You guys don't expect to get assaulted either, and it happens every day. Yeah, but contacts on fire. That was, those were not an asset. You have to wear a bunch of glasses, nobody get your contacts. I never had them knocked out, but but that was um that was the last facility I worked at. You know. So now, Jay, what are you doing now? What do you do after corrections? You oh, retired, I'm a, right? I'm a when, when private you... investigator now, since all my uh, UIs and investigations throughout the prison system. I saved most of them for courts and this and that, so I had to apply for my investigator's license and make a long story short, they really didn't want to give me the uh, license. They wanted to push me more towards security, act like they were paying me to uh, be a private investigator. So uh, I had four guys write me up um, some you know events that I investigated that they were privy to and then uh, plus some reports I had, I blacked out everybody's name, sent it to the state. Uh, I was the only guy to come out of corrections in the past 10 years to get a private investigator's license. Oh, very but good. I imagine, you know, because you had to really prove that you did investigation for a long time. Like regular COs just can't be investigators unless you're the rat squad, and, you know, which is, you know, inspector general. They really That's inspect, right. you know, they, they, uh, they're they the arrives. guys who uh, go and investigate COs and convicts. They do convicts. Too. I have an in interesting story. Um, my fiance works at a, um, let's say, a civilian company yeah, locally. And uh, later on in the podcast, we'll talk about the, the rat squad and, and sure. how maybe somebody would handle <laughs> the situation. But um, so now you're a private investigator. Are you, do you work for yourself privately? Are you... Um, are you hooked up with anybody? Yeah, I, I work, uh, you know, I take private contracts. Also, I work for a, a uh, local law firm here in the upstate area. Oh, that's, so that's very it's, good. It's interesting. Busy. Some, of the deals you, some of the driving you do is insane. Yeah, I, I do a lot of driving sometimes, you know, and other times. But it's a good job because now I have the freedom of total mobility, and I've always enjoyed that even in prison. I, I you know, being a sergeant mostly... I was able to maneuver around the prison compared to you know all the guys locked down and on housing units and stuff. Like I, that. I liked it when I when I worked draft. I was my technical technically my job was reception escort, so I walked the parolees out. But I had the freedom. I was on the response team, you know, the initial response right. team, because my job was it was draft, and that was like I was a second officer in draft. And that's in, in draft for people who don't know. That's convicts just coming into the new prison. Right, we from admitted, another prison. Right, so we, we process them in and we process them out. Right. And, um, it, it's a tough job. It was, it, it tough busy. in the sense that it was busy. It wasn't physically demanding because you had the porters do all the lifting and everything. But um, and porters are people we hire. You hire inmates inside the facilities. 
to accomplish tasks. That's technically the uh, the hard labor aspect of your sentence. Or, yeah. Or, See, is, I worked. I worked the real draft where uh, reception, where convicts would come from the uh, city prisons. You know, Rikers, mm -hmm. Brooklyn House, and you know any you know Orange County Jail, or whatever. And they would come right to uh, the reception center at that at, at in Downstate Prison. Yeah, that's uh, the uh, and that busy was place. now that's where you give them haircuts. And back in the early '80s, it was rough and tumble. When uh, when I uh, you know first got in in the 80, 1983, you know it was really uh, t tough. You know, but uh, it, it, it was uh, fun. A lot of interesting things happened. So you you you're enjoying yourself after retirement. You don't you don't regret it. Um, I should have. I probably re retired too young, but I didn't expect to. You know, when I made uh, lieutenant, I was in Manhattan, and then I was there for nine months. Then I transferred closer to home, where I could commute. It was still a little bit of a drive, but it was commuting was okay. And um, I was there for a year. They shut down that prison, mm -hmm. sent me back to Manhattan, and said, "You're gonna be here for two years." That ain't good. And I was like, I still had kids in high school. I, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm done. 28 and a half is enough. So I was I done. You know, and that was it. I mean, I kind of regret it, but I don't. I'm, I'm glad I'm out because now I see my buddies, you know, who are retired less than a year. And they're, and they're dropping dead and stuff. It's, re it's really a terrible, sad thing to see. Oh, that's you know? good. You got a mission. You need, you need a mission. And your mission to uh, you need something to focus. You need a little stress in your life to keep you uh, keep you acclimated. <laughs> keep you acclimated because you don't do anything. I mean, yeah. that's um, you know, it, it's hard. That's where guys I think start to fall off. They fall apart because there's no because they have nothing to do. Nothing. Well, they with feel like yeah, that like their their identity's over. They don't. You know, it's hard. What's left I mean, out there? I mean, I remember you know when I first retired. I, I hibernated for a year. I just didn't want to see anybody, really. I just wanted, you know, I don't know what I wanted. I just I know wanted a few to guys just, like that. They want to totally divorce themselves from the from the job. Completely. You know, I mean, I just look back and reflected on all the things that I was involved with and witnessed to and did and, and saw. I mean, it, it was insane. I, I didn't have the um, uh, when I when I retired. I retired in two thousand eight. You didn't have a choice. No, I didn't have a choice. No, that's you're exactly right. But um, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to actually to look back on my career. I was in the middle of a divorce. Right. That was um, my focus was elsewhere. Yeah. And that was uh, so, you know, in, in retrospect, you look back, that was probably a good thing. I mean, because once all the dust settled, well, actually, I don't know, everybody knows who's divorced knows that dust never settles. Yeah. It, it's there's but, always a. Uh, Something you know, I don't mean to cut you off, but you know they say you ain't a real hack at least you've been divorced it's once. True, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I still believe in the sanctity of marriage, and I don't recommend divorce for anybody unless there's circumstances which, you, sure, you know what I mean. But um, I I'll never recommend divorce. But um, that kept me focused. That gave me a mission. And then once the dust kind of settled from that, um, you you go you golf and you go to breakfast and you have coffee, which yep. which gets expensive. Yeah. So, so unlike you, well, kind of like you, you um, you became a private investigator. I decided to go back to school. Right. Because um, one of the main motivations for that was to, um, I, I'd like to do something else. You do get bored very quick. Yes. And plus, if any of you COs out there know that when you're divorced, the ex is entitled to half your pension. Yeah. Which, it's a huge motivating factor. When, <laughs> and not leave. <laughs> when she could just sit there and breathe and collect the twelve oh four a month from me. Yeah. And it kind of cuts your it cuts your pension in half. But you so know what? It's only money. It's not happiness is everything, bro. Yeah. All right. And kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's money is a, is come on. I mean, that, that's what prompted me to go back to school. And so what what, what could you do? I, I decided to um I, I took cyber forensics. Yeah. Cyber forensics and um, investigations, and so my bachelor's degree is now in uh, cyber forensics. Now, have you worked with, with local, federal and local police I've agencies? With, yeah, my internship, I worked with um, um, uh, State of the Art Cyber Forensic Center. I work hand in hand with federal prosecutors, uh, state prosecutors. Uh, That's awesome. State, federal, local law enforcement. 
I was actually an undercover asset for um, the, the county sheriff's department here. And I was trying to lure these these creepers and pedophiles and yeah. and build a case against them so they could prosecute them again. Um, so that was that, that kept me going. Yeah. And and I decided to stay in school. Now I'm attempting to get my graduate degree. And so when I'm done, I want to work for the government. And yeah. I'd also like to um, teach. I'd, I'd like to teach a lot of a lot of the. Um, I like to teach maybe in the field that I'm I've, I've studied in, right? In cyber forensics, but also, um, you look at like a lot of the colleges now they have courses called corrections, right? Corrections one, corrections two. Now I'm sorry, and you guys could probably everybody could probably um, verify this. Um, you can't learn everything there is to learn about the jail in a book. No. Well, I mean. You can't. You can't like do it. When you went to the academy, it was, you know, the academy I went to. I went to Albany, and um, really, it put a couple losers there with a good guy. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean, that's that's what they used to do. Is they used to ship out the rats from the prison. I didn't know that when I first. I went and to... they send them to the the academy. Now, when you're a new jack, that means just a rookie officer just coming into the system. You can just yeah. go to the academy. You don't know that. No, I went to Cuca College. That was uh our academy out there. That's when I came in. They're running three academies. Yeah. They're running Cuca. They're running Albany and Harriman. Right. Because um, that was a big flush of officers were coming in, huge influx. Right. But yeah, I looked at these guys like, oh, these guys must be the greatest and best must be the best CEOs, CEOs in the world. Yeah. And come to find out when you leave, they're all the freaking screw ups. Yep. That was the deal they took. You can't right. function in this jail or any other jail. We'll send you to the academy. So you got yep. screw ups teaching the next generation of officers coming. <laughs> yeah. It's a. Uh, I don't get it, you know. No, it, it, it's bizarre. It's totally bizarre. No, I mean there was the one guy that was in charge of my session. He was kind of not really in charge, but he let the younger officers who were there. One guy was there from uh, had nine months on a job. Who in the right mind had should be teaching new jacks coming in no. uh, with nine months on a job? Are you kidding me? You can't. You can't even. He share doesn't have any experience at all. He doesn't know anything. He's not privy to anything. So, the likelihood of him telling on somebody or so, something, or but they used to too. In, in all defense, good guys did want to go there, but um, most of the guys that wanted to go there were scared to work inside. Yeah, the walls. but you had guys too work there that I knew um, later on down the line that got injured by convicts in the prison and they just couldn't walk back into the, the facility. And yeah. I get that. Then. Yeah, they were either they were either. Legitimately afraid, afraid of the happening again, or let's face it, admin administration didn't want these guys down back because a lot of these guys were at a hair trigger. Yep. First comic, we'll get them cross-eyed. There's a UI. <laughs> There's going to be a and UI. A UI is a, a unusual incident, which means the convict either um, got hurt and had to go outside hospital, right. or stitches, or broken bones. Any any use of force though is a UI. No. When I was there, if you got a, no, that that's down. use of force is compared to UI because you could have use of force. I have hundreds of use of forces, but they weren't they didn't classify as an unusual incident. They didn't. Hmm? I know drawing sticks. Remember that was the big thing we used to do. Is uh, if we didn't like policy or we didn't like the memo that was put out from the administration, the union guys would get together and say, "Hey, we're all going to draw sticks today after lineup." Yeah, and they would, yeah. you know, if so many sticks were drawn, that was that was a UI. You have to be reported yeah. to Albany, or if um, well, it was, it was more of an action. It was like a union action because they didn't do it normally. Then right. that's a union action. I remember, or supposedly called the union. Remember action. meeting by the flagpole and um, waiting right till two minutes before the uh, yep the punch in, or or if you punch in, you wouldn't give your time card to the chart sergeant, so right. you have to go through lineup and call everybody's name. Absolutely, that was done to try and incur some overtime, but um, some facilities refused to pay it. Well. That got grieved eventually, and the guys yeah. won uh, the grievance, and they had to be paid. Well, one facility was we had, they we refused. Had guy that a charge sergeant that wouldn't pay guys, and I would I would argue with them about it, you know. And it, we, had, uh, we had the same thing. The one jail I worked at, um, they refused to pay the overtime, and the once the grievance came through, saying you got to pay the overtime. That's fifteen minutes. Anything eight minutes after, right? And eight you, minutes you get after. a quarter hour overtime. Then they would sit there and try to regulate swaps. They wouldn't let guys swap. Swapping is... Well, they can regulate that. Well, they wouldn't take it away from us. Yeah, they can do it. Because swapping was... That was their argument. You get a guy working on... If I'm on the east side of the jail, my swap partner's on the... Or let's say 
Jay, you're my afternoon guy. I work days seven to three, Jay works afternoons three to 11. But Jay did a swap that day, so Jay's off. So someone's covering his three to 11 shift. So I'm waiting for my relief and say the guy Jay swapped with is at the west side of the jail. Yep. And he's gonna walk all, and he can't leave his post until he's relieved. Yep. And say the guy relieving him is on the swap. Yep. It could really turn into, <clears throat> so the thing was, there's a wink and a nod, you either try to get an early relief or you wouldn't put in for the OT because you're going to swap, right? Right. But then once the union said, "Hey, we got to make sure we, you know, make our position known. We got to stick it to the guy," and and you put in for that overtime. Yeah, but see now it. that's where I mean that's happened to me before. Where when I was a chart side, I would uh, end up guys coming up wanting overtime because that guy had to relieve this guy, relieve this guy, and whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so it ended up being 15, 20 minutes, here comes the guy who was involved with nothing, but he got yeah. screwed over with the rate, late relief. But, you know, you get a decent crew. I've done it. Maybe it's not what you're supposed to do, but they would say, hey, hey, Mark, go down to two, uh, whatever dorm, relieve Jay, and get him out of here because he's on a swap. Yeah. That's on my tour. If I'm working 311 and I got nothing going on to chow, a lot of guys, a lot of um, um, walkway officers, Walkways, is that's a place where the inmates walk to and from programs or dorms. A lot of walkway officers had nothing to do until chow. Just keep an eye, yeah. So an chow, eye the dorm chow usually minute. runs maybe an hour after the shift change or two hours after the shift change. And they would say, yeah, go go run there and relieve Mark or relieve Mark or relieve Jay. And this way, no overtime is incurred. But most guys didn't have a problem doing yeah. that. But that was, you know, depending if you had a good charge sergeant, because I would take care of guys. You try to, because you, know, you, you got to make the I whole mean, thing work. I mean, that's where you're supposed to go, because... You never know when you're going to need a favor because I'll tell you what, I know you meet the same guys on the way up as you do on the way down. Yeah. And you never know. Yes, you do. You never know who is going to be your boss or who you're going to be the boss of, you know, in a lot of times. No, and, you're absolutely right. You know, so, you know, it's good to take care of the guys. So now, um, that's a little bit about us. Uh, I know we kind of digressed a little bit, but now the purpose of this of this uh, podcast, and we also have a, a Facebook page. The Facebook page is called Hacks with Loose Screws. You can just put it in the search bar on Facebook and, and you'll find us. We also have a, a Twitter presence. We are uh, ha, ha, at Hacks with Loose One. That's our Twitter account. You can um, you can tweet us. And uh, soon we're going to have, uh, we'll leave the Twitter open, the Twitter page open. And we can take live tweets, well, right. live during our recording. And um, we'll take suggestions on topics or issues. Um, same with Facebook. You can, you can message us on Facebook. And say, hey, you know, I'm I'm worried about this. Or I'm worried about that. I know I posted a few uh, articles about the the guys at Auburn and right. the attacks, the guys at Attica, the Attica Three, and, and there's certain things going on in our department. Actually, on the local news, I don't know if you watched the local news the other day, um, the union is addressing our concerns. Yeah, it was funny because they're talking about state prisoners showing a county guy. We're yeah, we're in a black pole <laughs> and a what the hell is this? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, also you can. Uh, Reach us at our email. With, it's uh, hackswithloosescrews at gmail.com. Yeah. If you don't want to... Um, we won't it, give any names out. That, right. Discretion is 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 most important here. That's our priority. We won't give names out. We won't give facilities out. We'll give general circumstances and, and you know, hypothetical situations. And maybe people out there can help us maybe solve someone else's problem. Yeah. Like you touched I mean, on... Also, you know, I mean, even the retired guys... Um, I mean, I had a situation here not too long ago. I had to actually use the um, EAP to hook somebody up. And uh, even though I've been out of corrections for a couple of years now, uh, I was able to contact that guy, give me the information, and I ended up uh, passing that on and, and got the person some help. So, I mean, I'm always available anyways, and guys who yeah. I know know that. Yeah, and, and Jay and I, we have contacts still yep. that are working or even that aren't working. And if... We don't know a guy um, initially or, or right away. We can find a guy who knows a guy. That's and, right. And <laughs> a lot of resources. <laughs> we have a lot of resources, uh, especially with the career I'm in, I, I'm pursuing. Um, there's probably ways that I can help in, in that aspect, too. Um, so th- that, that's the purpose. We yeah, do I have mean, a lot that, of concerns. I'm PTSD, willing to help you, anybody at any time. You know what I mean? You they need said, to talk. You want to you just write us or give us an email and just rant about something? We'll take the rant. I mean, because PTSD is a huge issue. And we, we have a mutual friend. He's not severe. <laughs> he's, he's absolutely I mean, I'm nuts. borderline, but he's severe. 
he's just gonna put a cat walk around his house so he can patrol. Yeah, I mean, come on, <laughs> this guy's out of control. You don't know what he's well, doing. Well, he he too is, and uh, I mean, when he goes to a, a public bathroom, he can't use just the urinal. He's got to go into a stall yeah. so he can shut the door and lock well, it behind him so he doesn't get attacked from behind. You know what? And I do that, the same thing. If I'm in a crowded bathroom, it's tough. Uh, I was at the Madison Square Garden a few weeks ago, and um. To go down to Penn Station, you had to use the bathroom at Penn Station. Yeah. You know, the freaking kooks down there. Well, I kind of I'll tell you right now, I'm looking for the first stall. I ain't going to those. I'm not going to pee in the urinal. There's no yeah. way. I don't know who's behind me. And maybe that's part of the job, too. You worry about... People you, coming up behind you? Yeah. So I waited for the stall to open up. I'll go in there and I'll do my stuff in the stall. Yeah. But um, it, it's... PTSD is a... Is a, is a it, it's... It might not be tangible. It might not be a tangible affliction. In other words, nothing you can hold or see outright. But guys, guys are screwed up. There's a lot of guys that yeah. turn to alcohol. They'll turn to drugs. They'll turn to lunacy. Our friend turned to fishing, which I guess is a healthy outlet, right? He just fishing. fishes. Fishes everywhere, yeah. He's looking for the shark. Yeah. He's going to catch a shark. <laughs> he did catch a shark, though. He caught a small hammerhead there. Yeah, but that wasn't a real shark. But he, I think it's too, is because he lives down in Florida now, and... Um, I think it's a hard time adjustment because now he's been around his buddies his whole life that were, watched his back and everything else, and now he goes down there and he doesn't have anybody. No, who do you trust? Right. He knows other hacks. He knows if something were to go down with us, I don't recall. I mean, he knows <laughs> <laughs> he knows that we have his back and absolutely no one's going to talk. But down well, there, he knows we if. He got in trouble. We would be there to assist him one way or the yeah. other. And, and in fact, I was talking to him on the phone today, and we we're talking about how certain people we don't like or whatever, which is very few for me, really. Yeah. Um, you know, but there's some guys I just don't like, and that's hey, same. Same here. I don't have to like people. I have to work with them. And um, he said, "Yeah, but if you saw that guy out in a restaurant and he was having trouble with somebody and whatever, you would help him." I go. You're yeah. right. I can't help him. I, not yeah. to help him because even though he may be an ass, he's still my brother. And and you, you got it. I'll I'll do whatever it takes. You're right. There's a few guys that I don't never got along with or didn't like the yeah. way they handle themselves. There's probably one guy I might turn my back. Uh, Maybe probably a rat guy. He, he was a rat. He so up, he I, he I don't really can't <laughs> I can't even describe what he did. Because he left our facility and went to another facility, and they they kind of drove him out of that jail too. And um, I really can't describe it. I'll, I'll talk to you off yeah the podcast about maybe we there. can work the story. Yeah, around. we can try to work it in. But um, him, I would probably walk away. Yeah, if if, if he was in and trouble, and that would that would hurt even walking away. Maybe, maybe I'd call the cops. Or I'd hit nine one one. Maybe, yeah. maybe. I mean, I know, away. but guys at certain prisons have come to our prison. Under that flag, or whatever, especially with a uh, a riot that happened at your supervisors, place. yeah, yeah, supervisors. Um, he did not do well mm -hmm. at all when he came to the place I worked because we got a. I'll tell you what, the place I worked, we had a bunch of tough bastards, and we don't need those yellow bastards, cowards, no. coming into our prison and allowing certain things to happen. And when he got to our place, he would try and get on the radio. And guys were yelling on the radio, he's hiding in the closet. <laughs> and, and this particular supervisor, uh, who supposedly, I don't know the full details, but it's good enough for us to take, really, you know, when you're working there, uh, could not be trusted because he ran and hid on guys that needed his yeah. help. And he was a supervisor, and he, he hit, and he got guys injured. Just like yeah. there was another guy that came from that same prison that you were at. He came to uh, my prison, and he lasted two weeks. He went one week on days with a sergeant that's notorious, mm -hmm. and then he came to me uh, for a week. And I the uh, guy we're talking about. Hmm? I wonder if it's the same guy I was talking about. I don't know. About. He was locked between. He was. There was a riot going on on his dorm. Guys were getting hurt. He was standing between like an airlock thing. One door was locked from to go inside, and another door that was locked to go outside. And he wouldn't open the door to allow officers to come in to save the other guys. 
he just stood there. A different guy. Until finally uh, the cavalry came, unlocked, where was unable to lock both doors and rescue the officers in that area. So he got driven out of your prison, came to our prison, which we've had many riots and, and large escalated, you know, uh, incidents, and wants to be one of our guys. And in fact, I knew I was a sergeant at the time, and I knew my block area. I knew guys were telling him, we can't talk to you because we're not going to be treated like you. And it was pretty serious. And they went yeah. through the academy with this guy and everything. Said, I can't talk to you. Yeah, I've yeah, I've run across that a lot of times. And we just can't and talk then to you. And I don't know whatever happened to that guy. He, he was only there two weeks. And then the, the guy who hid in the closet lasted three weeks. Yeah, because he went to the facility I was in last. So yeah, he, he, he did. He flourished there. That's because it was a... Well, that's a... That's the jail way that jail runs. <laughs> I guess my only regret, I know when I, um, before I retired, I said I wanted to finish out my career at, at, the, at your facility. Yeah. I was actually consciously thinking about transferring up over there and just retiring out of there and then, yeah. then moving on. But um, that's one of my regrets. But but yeah, that that was, uh, and those guys, he's still in the department, I think. I don't think he retired yet. The one, that guy, the, the, supervisor. the sergeant made a lieutenant. Yeah, he was, he was my LT in the, Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't get it. But guys slip through the cracks. I mean, when I was at, even that lieutenant school, it was funny. Everybody thinks, uh, you know, the higher-ups are a certain way that they don't care about us and all that. And, and I truly believe it's not true because I I became friends with a couple of guys up there who were, I mean, captains and depths yeah. and uh, from different prisons. And even the commissioner was Lucian LeClaire at the time. He came and spoke to us, and uh, it was really interesting to hear what those guys had to say because I only met him one other time, and I was at a riot in my place, and one of the, one of the officers yelled at him, hey, where's your surf boys? He goes, why do I need them? I got you. <laughs> and everybody was like, hoorah. You know, it was, it was great. And then, uh, But anyway, he came and talked to us at, at the lieutenant school, and he was like, Listen, we need you know we need to put confidence in your men. He goes, and they're your men to do the right thing and do their job and to protect themselves and not you know be writing guys up. And he said, yeah. I got thirty five years on a job. He goes, I can count on both hands how many guys I've written up my whole career. Yeah, and there's other supervisors who've written up <laughs> dozens, dozens, dozens. dozens. Of dozens. But here's the commissioner saying this. So why isn't this trickling down to the to the local jails the way they run? And same way with the, the captains and, well, and steps I talked to there. They get blind with power. Power is the one thing that corrupts completely. They, yeah. they get that white shirt, a lot of guys get that white shirt on and they think I, I know I know I know officers who are the biggest scammers ever. Yeah. Who would sleep seven hours out of an eight hour shift, who would hide, who would do whatever you could do to Make you work easier, more, more getting out of work than actually yeah. working. And all of a sudden, that white shirt comes on, and they go to all the hiding places they went to, all the tricks and stuff they did to, to get out of work. They would they would sit there and, and try and circumvent all that stuff. <coughs> so I remember having an argument with him. He came out and he he yelled at me, and I yelled right back at him. How can you go from being the biggest <laughs> scammer yep. in the freaking prison to now you're holier than thou? Oh yeah, you can go fuck yourself. Yep, that was the way. You can't. I, you I know the guy. That. Same thing. I, I used to, they used to send me out. I was hey, a couple of years in a job. I go relieve this dude out outside hospital every once in a while, and every time I went out there, I had to wake him up. <laughs> every th- and it wasn't. And I've been like out there five times in a right. matter of like six months, maybe so like once a month, maybe. Or, yeah. Every time I had to wake him up, so I know he's sleeping every night. So now he makes. Sergeant, and goes around breaking guys' balls for sleeping. Can you believe that? I was like, and we were getting on the bus one day, and I had my tie off. He yelled at me for my tie not being done. Are you kidding me? And I go, we're leaving. We're off duty. We're going. We're leaving. I go, you got to be kidding me, guy. I go, I woke your ass up how many times, and you're going to break my balls about a tie? I said, you need to find another profession. Yeah. And soon after that, I was out of there, but it was unbelievable. 
we had a um, we had we had a supervisor like that. And, and remember back in the day when the when the jails hubbed, you know, the, yep. everybody hubbed. So every hub would take, or every jail in the hub would take turns transporting guys to work release. So one guy, one supervisor, he was uh, he he'd write you up for looking at him stupid. I mean, he was just sneak around. He would he would hold his keys. He wouldn't hear him. One of those creepy guys. Well, anyways, uh, he went on to the bus. And I'll never forget somebody cacked his hat. Yeah. <laughs> usually you cack your hat with a with, a, with those water markers we have, you know, black or the red. Or not. <laughs> and they would come out. We Could would be wash permanent. It wash out, but no, we cacked it with a sharpie and did the brim of his hat. And he went on the, He was a guy. You know, he was all you know spit shined up, and he wore his brim down. He was yeah. you know, all Superman. Yep. He went on to the bus, and one of the officers in the bus told him. You know, he took his hat off. He told him he get mark on it. <laughs> told the bus to stop. He rolled down the draft. Oh, he flat. was his head. It was funny because his head was red, his face was red. Yeah, and he had that black mark, mark right across, across the, the straight across the front. You couldn't help but laugh when you looked at him. He well, was about to take our our jobs. He's about to take our swaps. He's going to take freaking <laughs> everything. This guy became outside hospital sergeant. Yeah. So now he had to go to upstate because the jail that jail we were hubbed and we had the we had the upstate that was our gig. Most yeah. of the people. Would, we would watch the upstate guys. So upstate was part of our our, uh, our thing. So he'd go out there, and he would try to tell the Auburn guys what to do. Yeah. Not to read a newspaper, or not to do this, not to. You should be in the room with the inmate, and um, it didn't work so well. I think he lasted maybe a month, and he bit off that job. Yeah. Because they, they told him where to go and how to get there. Yeah. How are you gonna tell a guy who works at Auburn with like forty years in the job? Yeah. Uh, you should put that paper away. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that's just one example of a jail. Those guys—that's a were, long time ago. Oh, a long time ago. And those guys were hard. They were hardcore CEOs. Absolutely. Well, look where they worked. Hardcore CEOs. Some hardcore. of the stories out of there are. are that's are, retirement are, mode. When once it did, they did their thirty years, it took them thirty yeah. years to get a job like that. Yeah, and, and and that guy, he was yelled at by the Auburn or the that that facilities that jail's uh, supervisor. Yeah, told him. Where to go and to leave his officers alone. Right. You know, That's right. And, you know, we'd sit back and just and we're just green with envy because, yeah. wow, that was that was cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes I mean I've been in cases where I've had to go to bat for guys and I have no problem with it, and where especially like when we're doing slowdowns, mm -hmm. everybody's wired up because there's everybody's tension because lieutenants and sergeants are getting pressed upon by the administrators because now their job's on the line because of they can't control their jail. And, and the bottom line is, I used to always tell guys, you know, don't get upset. You know, do what supervisors tell you. However, I said, always remember this. You're the ones, the officers control the prison. We help them. And uh, nothing happens without them turning the key. And that is the truth. Yep, absolutely. And right. so if you're not looking out for guys, because guess what? They'll look out for you. You know, if you yeah. look out for them a little bit, they look out for you a lot of it. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that, that that's probably uh, when you retire. Even if guys retire and do different careers, I think that's one of the things that they miss. They miss that camaraderie. They miss that the brotherhood. They miss the... Um, I know when I interned, uh, there was just things that would happen. And these are kids. I was the oldest guy yeah. in, in, uh, in the facility. Or in that forensic facility and um so everything that was funneled to me was all the, the child exploitation the child pornography right. that was shipped to my my workstation because you know i got 20 years i'm retired law enforcement so that's that's what i handled and you'd hear these guys and they would they would dry snitch like crazy <laughs> no freaking, drop it down. no clue what they're doing and you know the urge to get up there and and bounce that kid's face oh, off the up. keyboard was was almost it was almost you, you couldn't resist, but yeah, you did. You had to keep your mouth shut, right? Mind your own work, and right. You can't go to the bathroom the same time as him and explain to him in the bathroom, you know, nicely why he shouldn't do that. You can't right. do that because you get fired. Now, here's a story for everybody. Uh, my fiance works at a place, and um, uh, what she does is uh, her career. She's a lot of flex time. So you can go in at nine, you can go in at ten, you can go in at eight, whatever. You gotta work eight hours. Right. But your start time is flexible. You know, whatever, That's awesome. Whatever. Well, she works with somebody who's a, a they, they call them a team lead, and not necessarily a supervisor, but let's say Jay, you and I had a project, 
and um, they make me the lead guy. You say, right. Mark, you're gonna spearhead this project, and it's yours. You're the team lead. It doesn't make. I'm not like your supervisor, but but I'm in charge of the direction and to make sure the work's all done. Right. But mm-hmm. I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself your supervisor. We're still equals. We're still peers. Right. Sure. But I'm I'm charged with same pay grade. Same pay grade. No one's getting. So this person, um, this person's miserable. No one likes this person, and everybody hates this person. And she's rude to everybody. It's a female person. And so this person... I'm like a male person. We just got back from the garden uh, the night before. So my fiance said, I'm going to come in at 11, work 11 to 7. 7 is the latest time you can work. It's, you can't work past 7. Right. So um, this person said, I don't think you can work here past 6. Let me check for you. So that, that's, 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 this is all emails. So that's code for, I'm going to blow you in. Right. And... That person checked, and all of a sudden, the boss emails my fiance and says, maybe you should come in closer to nine. And so my fiance took uh, PTO time. That's personal time off, a vacation day for that one day. Yeah. But the next day, you know, she's all like, how do, how do you blow somebody in? How do you, now here, here's me. I'm giving her all advice that I would do in the prison. <laughs> you should leave a block yep. of cheese in her desk. Maybe you should, you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, it, yeah. But but you can't. I, I'm telling her to confront this person. Right. And basically, tell her how to fuck them over. Yo, you don't get do back. this. Yeah, you don't. You don't do this one more time. You know, we can talk about this in the parking lot. Yeah. It's hard not to bring those instincts. Yeah. Because to the civilian life. I hear. Because I and I hear you. Because I would. My wife would come home and complain about certain things about, you know, this person, that person. And she's rarely a complainer. She's the nicest person on the planet. You know, anybody knows my wife. But anyways, uh, I'll tell her, well, why don't you do this? You know, <laughs> Let's do that. If they end up with a little toothpaste in their ear, maybe they think twice. Or, or you know, the way we pull pranks and prisons, yeah. you know, we pull a lot of yeah. pranks. How about a cartoon? You know? yeah. <laughs> or, or something, you know, uh, some rumor or some, you know, bizarre thing. You know? Yeah, I was telling her to switch the keys around her keyboard. Yeah. When she types it all, you know, all kind of screwed up. But, but, but guess what? That's us. And that's not them. Thank God. Yeah, you get fired. <laughs> They'll fire you. Yeah, they will. And, and it's hard. You can't even go and what's this person now? I'm trying to use now. I'm trying to use civilian, uh, the civilian environment. I'm trying to use their logic. I go well. Maybe this person's bullying you. So I'm thinking, we didn't really get bullied in prison. I mean, I mean, come on. Somebody who's trying to bully themselves. I've had conversations with COs. We almost come to blows on the dorm. You give a crap. You don't, no. <laughs> you got a problem with what I'm doing, you talk to me outside this dorm. You know, guys, you don't want to be dressed down by a fellow officer in front of your inmates. I mean, Absolutely all, not. They're can't of, happen. They're a bunch of cons. Who really cares? But you can't lose your level of authority. Yeah, because I'll tell you what, the minute, the minute you do that in front of another officer, the convicts are... Not gonna, yeah, that CEO, you know, just said this about you, and they, well, and it's called uh, Games Comics Play, and they will play. Uh, uh, let me digress from the civilian side because that's really, yeah. I got a story. We, our facility on Saturdays, we come to this new philosophy because there's a lot of weapons in the jail. We're gonna give out razors on a Saturday, and we're gonna have a group of officers charged with picking up these razors, and we're gonna have them go through the dorms and exchange one for one. This way, razor control, which I guess in theory was a decent idea. So on a Saturday morning, you know, we had cleanup on Saturday morning. We started at 10. So my dorm was a reception unit. And what I would do, if, if, if the unit was clean and everything was done, I wouldn't wake the guys up for for, uh, for Saturday morning cleanup until, until 10 o'clock. You go to chow, chow with things at 7. Uh, 7 o'clock was chow. They can come back, get their cube areas set up. And if everything was set up with the cube areas, I now, would... Now, cube areas on like a cell. Right. It's just an open door, just little partitions. And, and so if they're... I would do a round, and if everybody's cube looked pretty decent, there wasn't anything egregious out there, I'd keep the lights off. I'd keep it off till 10 o'clock. Because honestly, everybody soft, knows... But okay. No, I'm not <laughs> soft, but I want some downtime too. You know, it's yeah. not, it's, I, I think it's more for me than them, but I can read the paper, have some coffee, talk to my fellow officers and stuff. Yeah. That's fine. But this guy comes in, gives me the call ahead of time. I'm coming through with the razors. Have all your inmates stand up with their razors. So I make the announcement, anybody wanting a razor, stand up. The razor rangers are coming through. We call them the razor rangers. So I had maybe 10 guys. I got 40 guys in the unit because half our unit, my unit is double bunked. And um, 
comes through, and there's the guys with the razors up, and, right. and this guy comes out my dorm, throws the dorm door open, right? Makes a big office, like, <laughs> make a big huge sound. And he says, you're supposed to have all the convicts on your unit up, like you're supposed to have them all up, and all of them have to exchange a razor. What kind of freaking show are you running? And he called me a few names and he walked out. Yeah. I'm sitting at my desk. What the hell just Rainbow happened? gasket. Now here we go to your games inmates play. My yep. porters, they've been my porters probably for almost almost six months. I had a decent rapport with them. Comes up to me, he goes, Yo, CEO, are you gonna let him talk to you like that? There it is. He just made you look like a punk in front of all of us. <laughs> I go, You're freaking right. Yeah. I run over to the next door and my buddy my buddy was over the next door. I fought, fling his the dorm door open, the, the partition door, rip yeah. it open, call the officer out. And he's with a sergeant. And that sergeant knew what was going on. Yep. And I was going to do him right, Jay, I was going to do him right in that unit over Yeah, there. true. That sergeant hightailed out. Because the convict jacked you up. Well, I was pissed to begin with. All he did was right. push me over the edge. He just pushed you over the edge. <laughs> but that's right. what they do. Sergeant looked. He says, I don't see nothing. Left the unit. Shut the door and locked it. <laughs> this guy's like, oh crap. I want to go there. I'm ready to take my collar wraps off. Absolutely. I was going to roll right in the rec room. You don't ever do that. If you have a problem with what I do, you take me outside and tell me. Yeah. Like, I didn't do nothing wrong. Absolutely. Didn't do a freaking thing wrong because when the Razor Rangers come through, there was a, the supervisor was with them yeah. as they walked through. He didn't, he didn't find a problem with what I did. And my unit was one of the cleanest dorms in the jail. Right. Maybe, you don't, maybe you're one of those rule book guys who... Who loves you know fucking with the inmates every two freaking three like seconds? Like now, some guys are they go on the unit, tip yeah. it over, and leave. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. So yeah, games inmates play. Yes, yeah. but they jack you up, and they get yeah. you up enough to tip. They tip you over the, the, to the, go after the officer. The look at my buddy's face, the officer that door. The look at his face was priceless. Yeah. He's on the phone, and he looks at me come through, and his jaw just dropped, and he's yeah. like, "Holy cow." I'll, th- I'll tell you a funny story is I wasn't a sergeant for very long maybe a year and there was an incident on the dorm where a female officer was working breaking up a fight right I respond with the rounds when we get there right around the same time and the fight is stopped and once we opened the door though the officer came running out to go attack another officer <laughs> and I pick up this female <laughs> officer and I carry her into the uh, into the office. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, that officer looked in the window. He saw me in between two convicts who were swinging at each other and didn't come to my aid. Are you kidding me? I'm like, that, no. She goes, absolutely. I go, oh no. I go, that is unacceptable. <laughs> oh. And so when I talked to him, he admitted it. He said he he, he told me, he goes, I said, where were you when she was fighting with these convicts? I said, oh, I was on the door waiting for the roundsman. I go, you know a roundsman has keys? Why weren't you assisting your fellow officer? Well, I was waiting for the roundsman to come. I go, you know, the employee's manual says about assisting your fellow officer. You come to aid to your fellow officer no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, he no longer works at that prison. <laughs> he, he, I, unfortunately, he made me do my job mm-hmm. and he got transferred out. It's, uh, I had a similar. Unbelievable. Incident. Uh, I was reception escort, so we yeah. had to bring this guy. Actually, the inmate we had a we had a call out. He's actually dead. He was killed uh, yeah. last year in in Utica. He was killed. Ah, nice. Yeah, drug deal gone bad. He was shot. Yep. And uh, well, anyways, he, he was a, a it's a very big inmate. He had to go to a family court date. Yeah. Okay. This guy was he he was impressive. He was huge. And I go to this dorm. And you know, I called the officer up, said I'm gonna be on the door, send this guy to the unit or to the door. I gotta tell him to pack up, get ready for an outside trip. And um, the officer does. I meet the inmate at the door to tell him you know, what we gotta do. And this guy is huge. And I got the rounds with me. And I'll tell you the name of the rounds after the podcast. Yeah. So I look at this inmate, and he looks impressive in a bathrobe. He just looks 
and I'm six foot. This this guy, I'm looking up at him. So he's probably six eight, six nine. He's yeah. a big guy. I go, you gotta go to family court. You gotta pack up. You know, I'll be back up in ten minutes to come get you. And he looked at me. He goes, I ain't going nowhere. So takes his in there. He takes his arms down. I'm thinking, all right, here we go. I look at the dorm officer. He's about five two. His nickname was Oompa Loompa. So I'm getting no help from there. And all of a sudden I hear this sound. Ching, 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 ching. Yeah. That was the roundsman running away. <laughs> I hear that. Wow. I look over there. And, I look and the convict me. knows. The convict knows. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, puff up. I look at him. I said, listen, buddy. You got freaking 15 seconds to get your shit together. I have a court order that says I got to produce you in county court family court right at this time conscious or unconscious it doesn't matter to me <laughs> right. but choose carefully because I'll pull this pin I'll have 10 guys up here and your own mother won't recognize you when we're done so you figure it out yeah looking at my watch the time's ticking he looked at me and he he, he did he looked scary as all hell yeah. I got the all right see you all right. <laughs> And he walked, and he packed his shit up, and then... And, I, and I'll tell you what, we have a lot of similar stories. I'll tell you my story in a minute. But what it was is he knew you were willing to put everything on the line. You yeah. were going to fight. Well, what and, am I gonna do? and he knew you were probably going to get in the ass beat, but it didn't matter. He knew you had guts enough to, to stand up and, and take care of business. And yeah. whether you win or lose, it doesn't matter. My, my plan was to pull the pin and just jump on him. Yeah. Hey, it's on. <laughs> it's going to go. <laughs> I, I, was, I wasn't a sergeant for very long again. There's an, uh, a convict that won't stay on room restriction, which means he's been sanctioned either by a sergeant or a lieutenant or a dep or whoever to stay in his room. He can't come out of that room only to go to the bathroom so and mess rooms, all. We had cube restrictions. Call outs. You couldn't leave your cube except for the bathroom. Yeah, it's room outs. restriction, you know, whatever. Yeah. So he wasn't allowed to play cards or chess or, or watch TV or listen to his radio or any of that nonsense. So um, it's midnight and... It's terrible when things happen on midnights because you just don't have the resources to deal with these things. Yeah. You know, so you got to be kind of on your feet a little bit. So there's two officers. I get on the unit because they had called me. They're huffing and puffing. They're ready to kill this guy. He's on the wall. And they're yelling at him. I go, stop yelling. Stop, stop yelling. Mm -hmm. You know, so I talk to, I tell the convict, you wait. They're on the wall. I take the officers in the office. I go, what's going on? They tell me, you know, bah, bah, bah. I go, midnights, guys. We don't need to be fighting on midnights, unfortunately. I said, but I said, if this is afternoon, we're killing them. But I said, today it's midnight. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> we have nobody to come help us. It's yeah, me and him. You know? crew, yeah. I said, it's not that I'm saying I won't, because I have fought on midnights many times. I said, I'd rather not. Yeah. You know. So I tell these guys, listen. Let me talk to the convict. I said, you know, he's probably seen me around because I work more afternoons at midnight. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if I was working midnights because I was New Jack Sergeant or because I was working overtime, whatever the case was. So, you know, these guys just stay in there. I'm not trying to undermine their authority, but this just needs to be resolved. I go, I go in the convict and I whisper to him. You know, I go, uh, guy, you know, know what's going to happen here. I said, either, I said, you're going to go back to your cell and be quiet and, you know, just do what the officers tell you. Or I said, I'm going to take you to the box. I said, and if I have to take you to the box, I said, I said, maybe you've seen me around. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. But I'm telling you this. I said, it won't go easy. And it ain't going to be pretty. I said, maybe you'll win. Maybe I'll win. I said, but we're going to figure it out right now. I said, what do you want to do? And so he started shaking. He, was, he got very nervous. He yep. started shaking. He goes, sir, he goes, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm going to go back to my cell, and I'm going to lay down and never hear another word from me again. He goes, can I <laughs> please take my hands off the wall? Uh, you go ahead. And he did. He put his hands in his pocket. Mm -hmm. He looked at me. He goes, thank you, sir, and went back to his bed. And the officers just looked at me like, what did you just do? Nothing. Mm -hmm. I said, broke it down. Know. I said, I, I didn't punk him. Right. Because you guys yelling are punking him. Yep. So you're making him do something that maybe he doesn't want to do. I don't know. Right. But that's what it is because he's the man. Everybody's a man, you know, mm -hmm. men in jail, you know. 
And so you're kind of forcing his hand. I said, me, he knew I was willing to put everything on the line, and I would have. I said, yeah. well, we were there and fought, fought and found out, or yeah. he does what I tell him. I said, but he knew I was willing to put it on the line. Yeah. And that's and he understood I was for real. Yeah, a lot of these guys and I was going to do it. One of my favorite pr- phrases was, um, you, you tell these guys if they're ready to, if they're ready to go, you remind them, we have the biggest gang in the state. <laughs> and that's right. The consequences from this incident are going to haunt you the rest yeah. of your day. Absolutely. So choose carefully. Yeah. And I used to always, you know, tell comics, you know, or tell tell officers, I would say, we don't lose. No, no. We don't lose. Lose not an option. And I would tell guys too, is we don't get hurt, they get hurt. Here's, here's, here's a funny story. When I was transporting, we had to pull a guy out of uh, S block. And uh, my partner, he was a martial arts guy, big guy, he's a black guy. He's best guy, I mean, my best transportation partner ever. He was just yeah. a really good guy. But um, he was also one of those guys that would look at an inmate up, size him up, he'd always say to himself, I wonder if I could take him. I wonder if I could take him. <laughs> well, we pick this guy up about an S block, and uh, he's had an incident with him before. So my partner's like, we're, we're going we're gonna to sell this today. And there's a bathroom, you know, the bathroom up in the upper gallery. There's a, yeah, yeah. So the officer goes in the bathroom. He goes, you get him, you send him in. And, uh, no shackles on him, no nothing. The inmate goes to the bathroom. So I'm sitting by the door. Yeah. And do you hear a little, you know, you hear a little, uh, uh, you know, little, yeah. somebody hit the Press ground really hard. And all of a sudden a little, I open up the door, it's the officer, or it's, it's, the, it's the inmate. Because you got to come in here now. And so I open up the door. The inmate immediately runs to the wall and puts his hands up on the wall. I look on the ground. There's my partner on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and the inmate, he's shaking. He's going, Sio, I swear to God, I didn't touch him. He, he tried to do some kind of kick and his heard a snap and he fell. He blew his knee out. Oh. He was going to do some kind of yeah, whatever. I didn't, wasn't in it to see it, but he blew his knee out right there. <laughs> He gained respect from the inmate because he was going to put Look, everything on the line. He was going to go right there in the bathroom. Lucky the inmate didn't pummel him. It's true. You know how dangerous that is. I mean, we've all done stupid stuff. I mean, that was hilarious, though. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. I, I I had an incident one time in a box. I worked the box for a while. I was an officer. And at the person I worked, it was getting, you know, the, because they used to send all the disciplinary problems in the hub to our right. our prison. That was just one of those things. And um, so I was also the guy who processed the comics in, whatever. You know, I did the, you know, strips and, you know, whatever. Give them the spiel about what's supposed to be expected and, you know, all this shit. So um, I uh, go down and I tell this guy he's got to leave. Said, yeah, pack your stuff up. I'll be back in... In five minutes. Right. Yeah, when you come in here, CO, you're going to get it when you open the door. So I hear all the comics talking. Oh, man. Right? It's on. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go, you know, get him locked out. And he's got everything he owns on. He's armored up. That's when you have everything you own. Um, yeah. Every T-shirt, every shirt, every coat. Yeah. You know? So he's armored up, and he's I ready. can see he's armored up. He's ready to go. And so I'm like, I tell my partner, up thing, I said, I'll be back. I said, if I'm not back in a couple of minutes, come get me. <laughs> he goes, you sure? You probably shouldn't do this, Jay. You know, I'm like, it's a box. Yeah. Got it. Gotta, gotta go. stand up or shut up. You know, I mean, it's just one of them things. We're men. <laughs> you know? yeah. So yeah. I go down there. I tell the convict I took and everything out of my pocket so this way I could cut or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Take collar brass off? That was yeah. I always took my yeah, all the collar brass off. off, everything, you know. So I tell the convict, I go, you ready? He goes, yep. And he's bouncing around, the, you know, in the back of the cell. He goes, okay. I open the door. I rush right in. I grab him by the neck, pick him up in the air, bam. <laughs> Dump him onto the uh, mattress, and I got him in a headlock, right? And he's like, all right, all right. I go, I go. Are you, I thought you were supposed to be fighting. Yeah, I thought we are going. <laughs> I, I go, what's going on? He goes, oh, my God. See, yo, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? I'm like, okay. I go, you're not even fighting. Come on. And he's like, no, no, I'm not fighting you. <laughs> I go, listen, 
<laughs> I said, I could tell. I said, all right, guy. I said, all your stuff ready? He goes, yeah. I said, I'll be back in two minutes and stop messing around. He goes, right. all right. So I lock the door, right? And I walk out of the cell this way. Because I got to tell my partner everything's good. Yeah, yeah. I heard comics work, you know, whispering. No, how bad he hurt you? He goes, I don't know. That, that CEO could have killed me, but he didn't hurt me. You know, he hurt me a little bit, but not as bad as he could have. He goes, and I heard another comic say, yeah, don't mess with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go tell my partner I'm good. I go back. Are you ready? He goes, yes, sir. And, you know, I let him out in the way he goes. You know? no, it's, but it's the way things go. It's the way it goes, yeah. Jail and jail's funny. It is funny. It's a funny job. To be able to couldn't do that in the uh, in the real world. All right, well, we're at yeah, we're, we're about an hour and five, five minutes on this. So we we'll should kind of um, wrap up. we got plenty of other stories to tell. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up in, uh, next week. Uh, we're going to try and post this once a week and hopefully maybe twice a week. We're going to bring guests when, when we find, you know, the right person to bring on, maybe fellow officers. Or, yeah. Uh, but also, you know, we're not limited to um, corrections or law enforcement. We'll talk about sports. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about beer, too. Yeah, beer. We'll talk about um, 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 current events, you know, like high-profile crimes going on out there, and uh, just about anything you want. We'll, 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 we'll and we'll consider. tell you more prison stories if you like those. Yeah, we'll always have some more but stories. But send, send your ideas and yeah, comments. Yeah, email us at um, um, hackswithloosecrews at gmail.com. Reach out to us on Facebook. Just type Hacks with Loose Screws in the search bar and you'll find us. And Twitter, uh, at Hacks with Loose One. Um, and we will respond. And hopefully we'll get to the point where we'll, um, we'd like to bring in some people. Uh, oh, yeah. Our, our friend from Florida. Yeah. We can well, figure he out he how said to... I could say his name, so Paulie D. Paulie D. He's, uh, <laughs> he's a character and a half. Um, he's got great stories. He, he does. He's, he's, a he's great probably one of the best storytellers out there. And, and I, I admire him because he's always got an angle. He's never standing still. He's always moving. He's always bobbing and weaving. He's going to put a catwalk around his roof of his house. <laughs> he can patrol. <laughs> he, he is a funny guy, though, and I, I love him. And, you know, he, yeah. he's a great dude. But, uh, you know, he's got issues like everybody else does. He's got a lot of issues. I think, you, I know, mean, you know. He's all you right, get, though. You he's... get mad at stuff. I mean, you even do it now. I mean, just like me. I can't walk into a restaurant and not be watching no. the door and counting everybody who's in front of me. Or sit with your back to the wall. Yeah, so well, that's come it. In. It's I just mean, one of them things. It drives my family nuts because I got to be the first one to sit down because someone will take my seat. You know what I'm talking about. Someone will right. take my seat. Yeah, well, my wife is a very good corrections wife. She knows what seat I need. Yeah. yeah. So, so yep. she just goes, or my daughter will happen to sit at the one seat and my wife will tell her, honey, you got to. But yeah. why? My fiance is the same way. She, she just understands. the way it is. She understands. So, um, again, reach out to us, email us, tweet us, Facebook message us. Um, any issues, you can private message us on Facebook. You can private message us on Twitter or just send us an email. And yeah. We'll get out to you. And if we can't solve the problem ourselves, we'll find resources for you and hook you up with the right people. Absolutely. And then right. we'll uh, talk more about the, this stuff as uh, we go on. All right. Awesome. All right, guys. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Have a good day.